Okay. So hi, everybody. I'm uh, Richard D. Webb. I'm here in Westport, Connecticut. I'm down at Campo Beach, which is part of our story here with uh, Scott and Zelda. I grew up here at the uh, age of 14. I read The Beautiful and Damned, and The Beautiful and Damned is uh, Treat Yourself. It is the least read of all of Fitzgerald's novels, and it's one of my absolute favorites. And because of my book and uh, our documentary, it's become much more popular. Mm -hmm. At the age of 14, I used to, uh, I, I read The Beautiful and Damned and riding around on um, my bicycle, I was stunned to read these passages and realized that I was literally writing on the geography of the book. It was literally a roadmap. I mean, it was stunning. It blew me away. Uh, and I thought I had found this, this great discovery until I found out that there was something called the internet and that, you know, th this was known to Fitz Fitzgerald academics. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be doing an overview of the beautiful and damned to start. That's very important to our story because as um, Charlie Scribner said, and he is the grandson of Charles Scribner, who uh, published Fitzgerald, who published Hemingway, and who published Thomas Wolfe. It's the dry run for The Great Gatsby. Uh, then I'll get into what you're probably all interested in, which is Gatsby. And I'm gonna be showing you uh, two clips from our award-winning documentary. Oh, The New Yorker just published the top 36 films of 2020. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the top 36 films, not just documentaries, not just rap videos, not just, but uh, Hollywood, everything. And we came out at number 30, so we made it. And I think um, you might be interested. And of course, I'm gonna plug things shamelessly, but uh, uh, you know, let me get started. And again, uh, let me share the screen. Perfect. I bet you can see this, correct? Yes. View, 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 view. View, home. So, can you see this? Okay, great. Well, I'll try not to do loads, but this is the cover of my book. It's called Boats Against the Current. This is Scott and Zelda on their honeymoon in Westport, Connecticut. That's the house they've lived in. I'll be talking about that. And the reason I, you know, talked about this being Boats Against the Current was when I started to explore the idea that Westport was the origin of the Great Gatsby. Uh, the leading Fitzgerald historian said, Deej, which is my nickname, um, if you try to get Westport uh, in the top 25 places that are meaningful to the Fitzgeralds, it's a wonderful but uh, lost cause. So again, what I did was I felt like I was a boat against the current for seven years as it took to write this book. And, research it, and some of you Gatsby fans might notice that that's basically, uh, that's the last line of The Great Gatsby. Uh, it's the last sentence um, of it. So when I did the research, and what was, in, I'm a retired educator for 24 years, and what was interesting was, I always told my students, you know, just don't believe everything you read, look for yourself. So what I did was I read every single thing that they ever wrote, um, and I wrote every, I, mean, I read everything that was ever written about them. And what a pleasurable task, by the way, that was, you know, that wasn't labor, um, but it was joy. 
And this whole thing is a culmination of something that I've pursued since I was 14. So let me do the math. Um, we're getting on some 40 years plus. So not only um, was it something that wasn't in the top 25, what I'm going to show you is that it was actually the place that they wrote about the most. And how did I find that? Again, by reading uh, everything they ever did. And it was right there. It was between the lines. It was in the lines. And so Zelda in the book uh, Saving the Waltz wrote about their honeymoon and their time in Westport. The Beautiful and Damned, which we're going to talk about. Uh, Scott wrote about their honeymoon in Westport. Uh, Scandalabra, her only play, talked, uh, uh, took the premise of the beautiful and damned and reversed it. That's about Westport. The Cruise of the Rolling Junk, uh, for America's first road story, as it was referred to. It's about Westport. The Great Gatsby, uh, I'm going to show you, is all about Westport. And five short stories that Scott wrote while he was in Westport, um, a few of them that mentioned Westport. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start uh, with The Beautiful and Damned, half of which was written in Westport, half of which is set in Westport in the fictional town of Marietta, which is Westport. Here they are, uh, one of my favorite quotes. This is their marriage within five weeks. They are in Westport. They got married in April in New York City. The reason they came to Westport was they were thrown out of New York City, essentially. They were in the two biggest hotels at the time period, the Commodore and the Biltmore. They got thrown out of both. The last one they got thrown out of, well, the reason was that um, they were, they took over for 30 minutes a brand new invention called the revolving door. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? The revolving door. Uh, by the way, that's used to keep heat in uh, or air conditioning. And they revolved within that revolving door for uh, 30 minutes. So what they did was they popped in a car. They were going up to Lake Champlain in Vermont. Uh, on the way, they found out, as Scott wrote to Ruth Sturdivant, he said, Ruth, uh, up in Lake Champlain, the water's too cold, and if Zelda can't swim, and we'll be talking about that later uh, in a scandalous sort of way, I think you'll enjoy. Um, if she can't swim, she's miserable. So they literally took a right off the post road. Remember, the post road's the only road between um, uh, New York and Boston at that time, and even further, but I love this quote, and that's what they look like, as um, at that time, um, Dorothy Parker said, it looked like uh, they had just stepped out of the sun. The interesting thing about Zelda there, when you look at the picture, she's 19. When they were in Westport, she was 19. He's only 24. So you're, you're talking about uh, a college kid in one way, and just to let you know, she did not photograph well. I mean, does she look cute? I'll leave that up to you. But uh, in person, she was irresistible. I mean, every male, and perhaps some females, but we only have the record of the males, thought she was irresistible. Here is The Beautiful and Damned, half of which is written in Westport, half of which takes place in Westport in the fictional town of Marietta. What I love about this is the artist tried to capture Scott and Zelda. And he said, uh, Scott Fitzgerald famously said, well, that's a pretty good rendition of Zelda, uh, but that's a pretty debauched version <laughs> of me. So um, again, uh, straight out of their history. Now this part, I'm gonna move through fast, okay? So um, don't worry if you're kind of not following it, if you just get the gist of it, I think that, um, you know, that'll be uh, important. So they moved to Westport. Um, they engage with a real estate agent. And what Scott writes about, now, 
remember, there's a great line, until you plagiarize it, it's not your own. I want you to kind of think about that. That's an intriguing sort of idea. And as Scott wrote, all my characters are F. Scott Fitzgerald. And by the way, a lot of his heroines uh, were uh, Zelda. So here they are. Uh, they're at the Gray House. I lead tours in Westport. Of, they're two hours long. They're beautiful. They're four miles in circumference. They're very, very popular. They're all sold out. But if you're ever interested in this, uh, I do this as a fundraiser for the Westport Historical Society. So here they are at the Gray House, the Gray family, one of the oldest in Westport owned it. And indeed, uh, it's colored gray then, it was colored gray uh, when it was built, and it's still colored gray uh, today. And again, I won't read you the quotes, but this is just this beautiful quote, uh, which showed how old it was. Um, this is the best intact place that they ever lived, historical, or historically speaking. Uh, there is an addition on the right that wasn't there at the time, but the porch on the left is the scene of one of the most uh, famous photographs uh, of the Fitzgeralds. You'll, you'll see it in many of the uh, histories. Now, don't worry about this. The, this is, you know, an overwhelming um, uh, sort of map. It's an aerial map. But what I did was, as a, you know, 14 year old, I had, uh, you know, read this scene in The Beautiful and Damned. So when I talk about Gloria, I'm talking about Zelda. When I talk about Zelda, I'm talking about Gloria because it's purely autobiographical, purely. And when I talk about Scott, I'm talking about Anthony Patch, who's the hero of um, that story. And what happened was in that summer uh, of their honeymoon was there was this party that Scott and Zelda had and one of Scott's roommates, they were all completely um, compromised in terms of alcohol. Uh, and one of Scott's um, uh, Princeton friends hit on Zelda and she ran out of the house. So I'll do this really quickly because what she actually did, Fitzgerald wrote uh, step by step, yard by yard. So don't worry if you're not following this, it's just getting the main idea. Um, she ran away from the Fitzgerald house. If you read the book, it's like a road map. She comes here, she goes there, she goes there, and she goes there. So you read the book, and again, it's really fun to read that book because you can tell to your friends, most people haven't read it. Again, it's the least read of the Fitzgerald books. So there she goes, she runs the house. Down the Different path towards the road. She goes up a little bit and sees this barn. It's the only house in Westport at that time between where the Fitzgeralds lived and downtown Westport. So it still exists today. Uh, side note, my wife and I almost bought it. She turned the fork down the road. The road's still there. It's called East Ferry Lane. And again, I just want to impress upon you that she was, uh, and both of them were walking the walk. Zelda indeed ran away in a big howling storm from the house. Scott indeed followed her, and he wrote about the entire passages step by step. Just another, you know, reference to the book. And when I lead tours, uh, people are very happy to actually walk this geography. Now watch this. I'm going to ask you to actually read this passage. Well, there you go, folks. That's Charles Scribner. And who's Charles Scribner again? His grandfather was the great owner of Scribner's and Sons, Wolf Fitzgerald. Anyway, and here Fitzgerald is trying out for the first time the dry run of the single most important symbol uh, of the Great Gatsby. Indeed, I would like to argue the most important single symbol 
in American fictional history um, in the 20th century, the green light, the green light that we all strive for, the green light that we all, for the most part, fail to get, but it doesn't matter. It's the pursuit of that green light that you can only do in, in America. And again, until you plagiarize it, it's not your own, right? And here you go. And if you think about it, everybody's got a story. Everybody can write about their own lives. So those of you who uh, you know, don't think that you can write a book, you can. But Fitzgerald's writing about his own life right now, and he's already floating the green light. Um, he plagiarized himself. By the way, that's, it makes it easier to write a book because you've already written parts about it again, um, and you can, you know, write about them again. Again, just step by step, um, uh, and I leave the tours that uh, go to this, and what's fun is you just step by step follow this, and when you get to the middle of the bridge, you look down to the right, and at that time, Westport, as most of the United States on the East Coast was completely deforested. So uh, you can't see it, but if you took those trees out, you'd uh, see all of downtown was for it. And there they go. Um, Scott and Zelda used to like to sit on the roof of this um, train station. It's still there. It's still largely intact from when they were. They would sit up there. What they would do is drink all night. Um, and stay up all night and then climb on the roof of this and wait for the 5.30 train to uh, New York City. By the way, it took 70 minutes to get to New York City then. It takes longer to get there today. All right, so I'm gonna make a transition. So please um, hang with me here for a second. And again, let me know if I am not showing this, but again, a famous, I mean, famous, well, it's famous picture, the shameless, hold on. Can you see this? Still seeing the end of the slideshow you just showed us. Okay, that's really weird. Let me try this again. Now you should be able There's to see your book. The, yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. What's fun about this picture is that that's the honeymoon cottage. That's the little gray house. There they are. Um, Scott wrote the cruise of the rolling junk. A great short story featured Westport in, in spades. And what they did was they came back to Westport in 1924 and took a series of photos for uh, 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 that short story. So what's fun is that's a, exactly a year before um, uh, Gatsby's uh, uh, published. So what's really interesting to think about was that they come back uh, just about exactly a year before he publishes Gatsby. And what I like to think about was what they did was he reorients himself with the geography of Westport, which shows up in Gatsby, which I will be uh, showing you in a second. One more shot of them um, as uh, newlyweds. Again, uh, incredibly uh, good-looking people. And what they were, and we talk about this in the film, was that they were America's first pop stars. Um, so let me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to transition. Okay. To our first video clip, which is not that. So hang with me. And first thing I want to ask is can you see this? Yes. I just see, um, what's his name? Uh, his, his estate. Okay. Is it Frank That's, Franklin? Yeah, so it's a, we'll, we will certainly get to that. 
So let me show you this. You should see this now, correct? Yes. Okay. So this is a clip from our award-winning documentary. Uh, and I'll be giving you more information about that. It's called Gatsby. And the New Yorker just published the top 36 films in America for the entirety of 2020. And I'm talking about every single film uh, that was made. And uh, not only did we crack um, those 36, we were number 30. So I'm gonna show you a couple of clips from uh, the film, and this is the first one. I find it interesting that so many people are digging into who were the sources for Gatsby. There've been some specific names proposed and then another theory, so we may never know. I heard he was an oil for a man who knew all about him, grew up with him in Texas. I knew somebody who grew up with him in St. Paul. You look at him sometimes when he doesn't know who anyone's looking at him. You can see it in his eyes. I bet he did kill a man. Which one is he? Yes, there is something that ultimately about Gatsby that we never quite know. You're not supposed to be able to grasp it. Right, his essence, yeah. But I don't think there's any any one person who served as a model for Gatsby. He took his experience, of course, as you're saying, it all comes from your own experience. But he blends different times of his life, different people he knew with himself and creates composites. In fact, Hemingway wrote him a famous letter criticizing him for that. You, you should base one character on one person, like I do. Like really? Hemingway does, yeah. You could have the ambition and the pretense that you would be able to see so thoroughly into another person's character that no part of you right. would show up in the description. Right. And I'm not sure I believe No, I don't either. And I think Fitzgerald wrote him back and rejected that all converges on Gatsby, and Gatsby is inexhaustible. All those people who claim to have a piece of Scott's um, original raw material in their community, they, may, they might have a partial truth. Everyone's colored by their own prejudice and where they grew up. So when we interview people from Long Island, they're all convinced Gatsby's from Long Island. The danger of writing a book about Gatsby is that you then hear from all these people all over the world who've got the key. We're not supposed to read Gatsby and think Westport. That wasn't Fitzgerald's intention. He wanted us to read Gatsby and think Long Island. But since he didn't have those experiences on Long Island, since they came out of his magic year of 1920 on Westport, where he had a beach, he had a cottage next to a mysterious recluse, that's what he's using as his model. I think the interesting thing about the, all of these speculations and surmises and everything is that it's great if it enlivens the book. It's awful if it weighs it down. Mm -hmm. My father was on the scene when we started to lose our way during Gatsby's time, and he recorded it all. The generosity, the greed, the innocence, and the cynicism, the magnificence, and the waste that was America between the two world wars. People read him now for clues and guidelines, as if by understanding him and his beautiful and damn period, they could see more clearly what's wrong. The thing that jumps out for me is she also puts it and his beautiful and damn period, uh -huh. which is... I can you know, see, uh, that puts uh, it right in your movie. Yeah. Okay. Uh, many of you might recognize um, that's Sam Waterston. Um, there's a whole story about <laughs> how we got him. And what I'm gonna do is I see that there's a stop share here. That's a very interesting function of... Um, uh, Zoom, so let me bring that back up. Um, and thank you for monitoring this because um, it's important. So let me bring this back up. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to try to. Mm, sure. Hold on. So thanks everybody for hanging on to this. Um, let me try to get back to, no. Um, what are you seeing on the screen right now? Just you and I. 
Okay. All right. Well, that's too bad because I am I'm not picking up as long as you can hear me, I guess you know, that's good. Um I'm not picking up. I'm going to go back to. And again, folks, thanks for hanging with me. Um, here we go. And here we go. So you should be seeing this. Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you. Okay, so now we get to um, who is Gatsby? And here's the aerial state photo of the mystery millionaire, Effie Lewis. And Scott and Zelda lived on the corner of this estate, just like Nick Carraway lives on the corner of Gatsby's estate. And by the way, the idea that Gatsby is set in Long Island, Great Neck to be specific, is it's correct. Uh, what I like to say is that Gatsby is a beachy blend of uh, Westport and Great Neck. What's interesting is when we did the research, uh, you know, obviously you go to Great Neck, and we found that they were inland. They were far away by a couple of miles um, from the coast, and that does not fit Gatsby uh, by a long shot. So Scott and Zelda lived on the corner of this 175 uh, acre estate. Uh, I'm just going to point it out. Here it is. That's the home of the mystery millionaire F.E. Lewis. Um, you see here a reflecting pool, a bandstand, multiple beaches. We're going to talk about this boating complex and uh, that tower there as um, uh, we, we progress. Scott and Zelda enjoyed uh, walking down here, going to the reflecting pool, going to the bandstand, and going out here and um, swimming. Just a quick editorial note, when I started researching F.P. Lewis seven years ago, there was one thing on the internet, um, and that was it. It was an obscure reference to a banking investigation. When I reached out to the family, they refused to speak to me, um, but since then, uh, as you're going to see, we made a lot of progress. Here he is, Effie Lewis, on the left at Longshore, the great estate that Scott and Zelda live next door to. Uh, there he is on the right. He was a major boater. Uh, we're going to be talking about that. Um, and there he is. Uh, 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 middle-aged at the peak of his powers. There's the Longshore Estate, uh, which Scott and Zelda visited. And what's interesting is when you look at this photo, okay, this is 1920, and we're talking about a mansion, and obviously Gatsby lived in a mansion. And if you've seen the films, Gatsby's mansion is shown as this sort of, you know, French chateau, Norman turreted, uh, gigantic sort of place. And, and indeed, it's described like that in the novel. But what it's also described at in the novel is this ramshackle place. And as Charles Scribner III uh, pointed, he goes, uh, Deech, you know what? Um, this is a ramshackle mansion. There's a lot of architectural details here. And in these days, with these great McMansions, uh, this may not qualify as a mansion, but in 1920, and well, I think it does, but in 1920, it definitely qualified uh, as a mansion. Here it is today. It's still 175 acres. Um, what they did was they grafted something onto the front here. That's the Longshore Hotel and in the back, but you're gonna still see that this is the uh, core of the house. 
This is the entrance to Longshore in 1917. Why do we care? Well, Nick Carraway says, instead of taking the shortcut by the sound, we walked down the road and went in between the great posterns. Well, here they are. Uh, this is what Effie Lewis um, built in 1917. And uh, look, by the way, if, if you're watching this, the Westport thesis, we have proved to everybody. I mean, what I mean by everybody is that everybody that we've shown this to, um, that quote unquote counts, you know, the uh, Fitzgerald uh, academics and everybody else, including the head of the Great Neck Historical Society, who after we showed her this information, said that uh, Great Neck concedes to Westport as the setting for the Great Gatsby. Look at this picture. Now, I showed you the aerial shot here. Here's the reflecting pool. Here's the bandstand. They're dancing. Here's a full piece jazz band. And in Gatsby, there's this beautiful little lengthy explanation of uh, the jazz band at Gatsby's party. So this is an F.E. Lewis party. Scott and Zelda uh, attended um, many of these. Uh, and look at this photo. It's just the 1920s, raging 1920s. I um, just want to show you this. He had a series of stables on the property. And why do we care? Well, he introduced the Arabian horse to America. Um, and uh, he was one of two to introduce that at the turn of the 20th century. It became a very popular horse. And indeed, um, what happened was that uh, Buffalo Bill Cody, um, his favorite horse in his Wild West shows was Musan. Musan was one of Effie Lewis's uh, horses. By the way, like Gatsby, he um, owned other properties. He owned an 8,000 acre ranch uh, in California. Um, he raised prize cattle, prize pigs, prize hogs, uh, the Durox that he raised were the most famous in the country. The feeding techniques that he pioneered are still in use today. On that 8,000 acre estate, what he did was uh, he had to build a, a home halfway uh, in that property because what you had to do if you traversed the entire property was spend the night um, halfway through. Uh, Diamond, uh, what he did was his brand for his livestock was a diamond over bar. And indeed that is now the entire city of Diamond Bar, California. Who's from Diamond Bar, California? Uh, Alexis Morgan. The, the great uh, women's soccer player, uh, Olympic soccer player, and uh, one of my favorite little asides, Snoop, doggy dog. Okay, now here's a tower. Mm, why do we really care about this? Well, in Gatsby, right at the beginning, more or less, he talks about Gatsby's guests diving from the tower of his raft. And indeed, here's the tower. He had rafts offshore. And to the right is a significant boating complex. And I'm going to focus on that right here. Now, this is a pretty incredible photo because what you see here is a massive boating complex with spars where he would raise his boats in for winter storage. And let me show one of the boats that he put into winter storage here. This is the Kima, all right? This is his private yacht. 55 sailors burned four tons of coal a day at sea and just that dock cost a million and a half dollars to maintain. Patriotic guy, as we're going to see, 
he donated this to the U.S. government. It became a ship that patrolled Battery Park in um, New York City. So look at that. Now, that's a yacht. So it's interesting, too, that she could have fun and predicate is that Gatsby first decides he wants to be a millionaire when he's the deckhand on Dan Cody's yacht. And here you see uh, Effie Lewis. Now that's when he's at Longshore. He's wearing that hat as we're going to, you know, he's a Western rancher, so I like to see that. Those are just four of his seven boats besides that great yacht that we have just seen off of Longshore. Um, two of them were one of the fastest boats in America at that time. They were called hydroplanes. They were speed boats. And what they had was twin Allison aircraft engines, uh, which propelled them at insane speeds. They were among the fastest in the country. Well, here you see one of his seven boats called the Stranger. He had seven of them over time. You'll see that on the rear, it says Los Angeles. Again, because uh, he's from, you know, also had a place in California that he summered in and then eventually uh, moved full time. And um, he had another one, uh, his later one was went out of Honolulu. And what he did in 1938 was he did a deep South Seas voyage. Part of that voyage was he was spying on behalf of the US government on Japanese naval installations in Southeast Asia on behalf of the Roosevelt uh, administration. Um, Fabulous brought back the first seals for the San Francisco Zoo. Now, I just told you about a hydroplane, the high, high powered speedboat. This is another hydroplane, literally hydroplane seaplane. And this is off the Lewis estate. Why do we care? Well, the Great Gatsby is 50,000 words. It is one of the most compact books ever written. And as Mark Twain said, sorry for writing you a long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short one. So let's look at that quote. Um, to write a short letter, you've got to telescope things um, and convey meaning in a very shorthanded fashion. So. Almost every single sentence in The Great Gatsby is pregnant with meaning. So when Gatsby says to Nick Carraway, and this is right when they, they meet, he says, hey, old sport, do you want to, and I'm paraphrasing, take a spin uh, in my hydroplane uh, on, on the sound? It had a double meaning. So readers would have thought either it's one of these fantastic high-powered um, speedboats, or it's one of these, which is a seaplane. Now, remember, this picture is 1917. The plane has essentially just been invented. A seaplane, unheard of, rare, dangerous to fly. Um, and if you owned one of these, it was the equivalent today of Elon, of owning one of Elon Musk's um, uh, spaceships. Um, so again, it, it's a double meaning, and Fitzgerald was, was quite uh, aware of that. Well, here's F.E. with one of his four wives. Yep, he was married four times. Uh, his last marriage was to the 18-year-old daughter of his college roommate, so he was a bit of a rakish um, figure. Uh, I'm showing you this car because what he was was a champion race car driver, too. So in analysis of things like his uh, motoring magazines between 1907 and 1914, 
He's in many of them. Um, he never won first place, but he often paced uh, third or fourth. And what I love about this is in 1907, uh, the winning car uh, won at a speed of 40 miles an hour. He owned three of the most expensive cars at the time period, two of them in 20. $18 when I did the research, so it's more, more now. Two of them were worth $160,000 in today's money. One of them was worth uh, a, a cool $240,000. All right, um, we're kind of at the crux of the presentation here. And I'm just going to let you take some time to read the top headline on the left and the, the top headline on the right. Okay. Here's the Gatsby party, here's the template. In 1917, F.E. Lewis hosted the greatest party in Connecticut history to this day. Pound for pound, I'll argue it's the greatest party in American history, privately done. It was a World War I fundraiser and it went on all day. And who did he bring in? First of all, people got to fly. In 1917, if you were able to fly, today it's going up and flying in space. He brought in a multiplicity of entertainment. David Belasco uh, hosted a play at this fundraiser. Who's David Belasco? If you see any Broadway play, if you see any Broadway musical, he invented the template for the stage presentation and the lighting. He was also the manager for Ina Claire. There's the picture of her. Ina Claire was Fitzgerald's favorite actress. She made, at that time period, and this is not adjusted for inflation, this is the money at the time, $5,000 a week. She's the highest paid American actress at that time. And She's there and Velasco is managing her. Uh, Fitzgerald had pictures of her uh, put up all on his dorm room walls at Princeton and indeed he wanted her to play Nicole in Tender as the Night uh, in the Hollywood uh, version. John Philip Sousa and his band came. He's the king of the March music. If you don't know who he was, he's incredibly famous. And not only that, he um, composed a piece specifically for the event. Houdini, there he is. To get Houdini to come to your party, that's insane. Uh, and what they used to do was push Houdini off the dock and, um, you know, he did escape. But Lewis went one step further. He was uh, raised and lowered by a crane into Long Island Sound, uh, those cranes being used to uh, use the ships. Annette Kellerman was there. Annette Kellerman did two things that's incredibly famous. She was a champion swimmer. She invented the sport of synchronized swimming. She um, invented a radical new swimsuit, the one-piece swimsuit. Um, which Zelda wore. Zelda wore Annette Kellerman's one-piece swimsuit. She was one of the first to do it. And what she used to like to do, it was very racy. You know, there was, there was no greater revolution in women's swimwear until the bikini of 1946. And what Zelda used to do was she would intentionally pick a tan beige color. So it made it look like uh, she was uh, nude while she was swimming. Marceline the Clown, 
most famous clown in American history. Um, he had a cartoon called Marceline the Clown that somebody uh, drew a series of his adventures. He did a 10 year residency at the Hippodrome in New York City. This is, you know, we're in a time period where Celine Dion did a year. We're in a time period where um, people do, uh, you know, Britney Spears a year in Las Vegas. He did 10. And Charlie Chaplin, the most single famous important actor uh, in the history of film. What did he do? He plagiarized Marceline. So when you watch Charlie Chaplin, that's what Marceline used to do. And Charlie Chaplin was pretty open, saying he um, uh, copied him. Whole animal circus shipped out of New York. So in New York at the time, they used to have a zoo down on McDougal Street. And the, you know these animals were rented out to like the Metropolitan Opera and to various, you know, musicals and Broadway plays. He rented these. They're, these are lions and tigers and giraffes and bears, half of which were brought up by barge from New York City. The other half were brought up by private train. Um, one of my favorite stories about this entire event was, first of all, 800 cars were parked at this event. 800 cars in 1917 is a staggering amount of vehicles. Very few people even owned cars. I don't know what the numbers are, but if I were to you know, add up the number of cars in Connecticut, uh, <laughs> maybe it's a thousand and 800 of them were there. What he did was the great piece de resistance midday was that the party goers saw a stagecoach being pulled by Lewis's horses at a furious rate of speed. They were being pursued by Native Americans who were being pursued by cowboys. And uh, they save the stagecoach from the Native Americans. And who is the lead cowboy it's F.D. Lewis in a giant white outfit on a white stallion with a great white hat. By the way, these cowboys are from the West, and these Native Americans were shipped East. They are true Indians. Arapaho, Sioux, Lakota. Incredible. All right, take a look at some of these headlines. Now, Scott and Zelda arrive in the first year of Prohibition, and they also arrive in a town that completely ignored the laws of Prohibition. Connecticut and Rhode Island were the only two states to not ratify Prohibition. <laughs> Isn't that fun? And the reason is, is that they had the largest per capita Italian-American population in the United States. You do not take away the Sacramento wine from uh, uh, the, the Italians and the, the, the great Italian practice of growing your own wine. Um, and just to show you uh, that middle top headline, that's $17,000 worth of booze in a single truck. That's a quarter of a million dollars today at the bottom left uh, when that taxi overturned that uh, they found booze in the headlights, they found booze in the fenders, they found booze in the wheel wells, they found booze in the seat cushions, and they found uh, uh, booze in the entire superstructure of the car that was invisible underneath the upholstery and all the mechanical um, functions of the um, house. So, you know, they come 
in a town with four cops. Okay, there's four cops. Half of them are Italian. So they're not going to, you know, enforce prohibition. Half of them are Irish. And I can say this, okay, because <laughs> I am more than <laughs> Irish. You're not going to find an Irishman who's going to uh, enforce prohibition, okay? Now, take a look at the left. Take a second to read that. I'll explain the right in a minute, but, you know, Take a second to read that. So this is the local newspaper. And they report Fitzgerald getting into an accident. He's, by the way, he's on the way to what you see on the right, which is the mirror mark which is the most famous speakeasy between New York and Boston. George Raft, Humphrey Bogart, Jimmy Cagney uh, were patrons. And what is the link to Gatsby here is that you'll notice that Scott, they, they were probably drinking before they even got in their cars. And... Um, he gets in an accident on the way, and he loses a wheel. What does Scott do? He uses this and recycles it in The Great Gatsby. When in, I think, the first or second major party scene in Gatsby, what does one of uh, the guests do? Gets in an accident and loses a wheel. So Scott recycled his own experience uh, here. Here's the compo win. This is another place, uh, which was, to our story, just as important. This was a famous speakeasy, too. It had a deep um, hill of a drive. With two accounts that we have verified, eyewitness accounts, of Zelda hanging on to the hood ornament at uh, the front of a taxi uh, for dear life as she descended uh, this road. Um, one of the two accounts says she was naked, uh, so you can pick what account you want. But to the right is the guy who supplied the bootleg alcohol to the compo Inn, um, who was owned by Jake Levy, and the brother-in-law of Jake Levy, who supported, you know, who sent all the booze, uh, to the Conco Inn and Westport is the guy you see on your right. Now he's Bald Jack Rose, so famous at the time, they named a cocktail after him, the Bald Jack Rose. And he controlled uh, the rum running operations in all of Fairfield County, who was from Norwalk, Connecticut. But he shows up in Gatsby too. Why? Meyer Wolfsheim, who I like to think was predicated on Bald Jack Rose. Meyer Wolfstein talks about the murder at the Metropole of Rosie Rosenthal, an actual event. There was a murder there by Jewish gangsters. And Paul Jack Rose turns state's evidence uh, uh, against the murderer who was a corrupt New York City cop. So there you see Meyer Wolfstein. Um, so another template for something in Gatsby. Um, just have fun with this. Top left, read the headline, then to the right. So they enter a town. By the way, at that time, the great literary critic, Van Wyck Brooks, said, that the entire cultural and literary access of the United States passes through Westport. And it was also a hell of a party town. What Scott and Zelda did was that Edmund Wilson, the great literary critic of the time, and also a personal friend of Scott, said that Scott and Zelda engaged in the nude orgies of Westport. So, you know, look, this is gloves off fun time. And again, what do you see in Gatsby? 
gloves off, fun time. Ah, uh, that's so fun. I just, um, in 1925, they sold Longshore. Uh, and I'll just read for you, because it gives you a sense of, of the estate. 175 acres, sculpted gardens, solarium, six bathrooms, vacuum heat. What's, you know, that's incredible at the time. Fireproof stables and one mile of waterfront directly on the sound. Um, fabulous. And there again, you see the boat complex there and you see the great posters. Um, if you're interested and if you want, it's uh, on Amazon Prime, you can rent it for free. It's called Gatsby in Connecticut. It's, uh, about my search. I'm the executive producer, and uh, this is by my good friend Robert Stephen Williams. This is his film, um, and again, it's an award winner. Amazon Prime, easy to remember. Here's the book that is part of the movie. And this is where all the serious academic research is that we couldn't fit uh, in, in, into the film. Um, and if you're interested, uh, you can get it at any number of, uh, Amazon's you know, obviously the most popular, uh, but if you're interested in a signed copy or anything like that, you can um, you know, send an email to what you see. I'll give you a second to take a look that email address. And then I'm going to show you a clip that, you know, obviously I've seen so many times that's in a film, but every time I see it, and I'll probably do it now, I get at least a lump in my throat. So if you're interested, further information, um, library's got a copy. Uh, thank you for that and um, boatscurrent at gmail.com. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close. Well, this is a whole other story. So I'll just, uh, I'm gonna get out of that. And I'm gonna show you a great last clip. You should be able to see this. Do you see this? Can you see this? I did, and then it went away. Weird. It should be on. Hmm? Do you, do you see the last page of the Great Basket? You're, yeah, the, the, um, I'm just seeing the slideshow. You're just seeing the slideshow. But I saw the black screen that we saw before for the previous clip for a second. Okay. There we go. Oh, okay, great. So this is Sam Waterston. And this is a highly emotional moment. He is reading the, the ending of the greatest ending of 20th century literature of The Great Gatsby. Then I wandered down to the beach and sprawled out on the sand. Most of the big shore places were closed now, and there were hardly any lights except the shadowy moving glow of a ferry boat across the sound. And as the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away until gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world. Its vanished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house, 
had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. And as I sat there brooding on the old unknown world, I thought of Gatsby's wonder when he first picked out the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. He had come a long way to this blue lawn, and his dream must have seemed so close that he could have hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him, somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow, we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther. So we beat on, boats against the current, worn back ceaselessly into the past. Oh boy, every time I see it, every time I see it. Um, I mean, Sam Waterston, you know, uh, doing that. And uh, I know I have uh, paused this, so what I'm going to do is you're going to see my talking head uh, once again. I'm trying to open up um, that. Let's see, so no, it's not obeying me. And again, that's that's classic. Now what's interesting is I'm I'm seeing the image of myself, uh, but it is not allowing me to. It's weird. This is classic. Yeah, it's not it's not opening up. Um, so give me a second and let me see. I promise this isn't me, uh, but this is no, I don't want to do that. <sighs> All right. You can just hang a little longer. Here we go. I've got it. Okay. Oh, I, I had it. <laughs> so hold on. Stop share. All right. Do you see me? Okay. Great. So I'm going to see if there's any Q and A. There's not. So, um, I guess. I have a question. Sure. Tell, so you you alluded to Sam Waterston. Um, tell us how that how he how he got involved in the project because I think that really added a lot to the film. Oh yeah. So yeah, you're right. Thank you. Good point. So a good friend of mine, Noel Parmentel, the 90 years old, knew Sam. Now Noel was a very famous journalist at one point. He, uh, he, among other things, he had the great quote about Richard Nixon, would you, um, uh, you know, buy a used car from this man? <laughs> so he was, a, he was a very famous journalist, and he said he knew Sam. And I was like, okay, no, you know, really, you do? Well, two days later, I called Sam through uh, Noel's contact. Um, Sam picked up the phone. He talked to me for 45 minutes. He was uh, one of the great gentlemen I've, I've ever, ever had to deal with. He, um, 
Uh, he, by the way, he is as literate as a person as he is a great actor. He's from one of the oldest families in America. He's from uh, Boston, Back Bay. So it was, it was from a mutual friend. I thought it would never happen. Um, and what, what I did was I sent a car to pick him up, to bring him to Longshore, to bring him to Westport. He said, uh, DJ, give me an hour. And five hours later, he left. Uh, he was so into it. So it was, you know, absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Okay, anything else? Uh, I don't see anything else. I just was really impressed with the comments that he made uh, in the film. Uh, they were so astute. I was very impressed. I, I've been a fan of his for a long time. I think he's a wonderful man, but an actor. But I was really impressed at his um, comments, literary comments about the book. You know what? I think actually uh, his acting is secondary to mm -hmm. his intelligence uh, and interest. So thank you so much uh, for allowing me to do this. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all you know, the contact via email and, and talking to you. And thank you so much for working late into the night as it were here. And uh, I wish everybody, a, and you know what? Spend a day, because that's about all it takes uh, to read The Great Gatsby. And um, it's a great treat and uh, I encourage you to do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deej. We appreciate Bye. it. Take Bye. care. Bye.